Um, tell them a little bit about some of the work that you've been, been doing in terms of uh, labor and following uh, labor in Los Angeles. And then we'll talk a little bit about the film and then ask the students to ask some questions because they've always have some great questions to ask about what's going on. Okay, well, um, I um, teach at UCLA in the sociology department and I also direct the Institute of Industrial Relations at UCLA. And so in both those roles, I've been engaged in um, this field of studying labor in LA for some time now. Um, and I just completed a book which will come out this summer. I'm not quite sure what the title's gonna be. I'm still struggling with that, but something like Work and Unionism and in an Immigrant City, Los Angeles Exceptionalism and the Future of the Labor Movement. And basically the book- That's a small um, title, huh? Sounds like a little a long. Yeah, my son, who's 13, commented on that. He said, oh, I told him I'd finally finished the book. This was last summer, he said, what's the title? So I told him that version and he said, mom. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come up with something better than that. So um, we're working on it. But you, you got to add like sex, violence, or something. Exactly in the title. right. Sex, violence, and unions, or something like that. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I have a very unusual last name. So if you're interested, just look for it next fall, and um, you can just find it from my last name. But in any case, um, it started as a study um, of immigrant organizing, uh, some of which you saw depicted in the film um, in the 1990s, and it became a more historical project because I basically figured out that um, the, the LA has a very unusual labor history that I think positioned it to become the number one labor city in the United States, which it, I don't know if you're aware of that, but I think um, Professor Garrow mentioned that earlier this evening, and that really is the case. So this is a, a time in the United States' history when the labor movement is in deep trouble, but Los Angeles is one of the bright spots, actually the main bright spot on the, um, landscape in terms of labor organizing and a lot of that is related to immigrant organizing here in this city and I'm convinced also it's related to the very unusual history of LA um, which I can say more about later but mm -hmm. so that's what the book's about and um, you know obviously it's very related to what you just saw um, I just want to also mention one other thing which is that the latest gossip anyway although I guess nothing's really been finally decided about um, what's happening in the situation that was mentioned at the beginning of the hour in the LA County Federation of Labor um, the leading candidate is no longer Kent Wong, who's my colleague at UCLA, but actually Maria Elena de Rosso, who you saw quite a bit of tonight. Though there was an ex expectation that there would be an announcement this afternoon about that, and I guess it has been postponed, so we don't know the final end of the story yet, but that's, at least that's what I've been hearing, that she's the most likely um, leader, and I, you know, it's fitting in many ways since she was the widow of Miguel Contreras, who died very young of a heart attack last May, and um, she wasn't prepared to assume the job then, which she probably could have done if she'd been interested, mm -hmm. but some, many people are, are saying that she now is ready I mean, to I think a lot it. of people wanted her to take the job, but she just felt that her husband was doing and it, and, she, and yeah. it just didn't, she didn't need a time to grieve and, 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 not, and not deal with that. She, but she's a, a re, I mean, if you could tell on the film, she's a real strong lady. She's, you know, she's bawled me out a couple of times, too. <laughs> Every time when I, when I say a couple of things, she says she, she doesn't agree, she'll call me up and, you know, and let me know what she thinks. So she has no qualms about that. But it's an amazing story that, you know, she comes in, helps take over a union, and they're not clear as to who really won. I mean, it was clear who won, but it was the existing union leadership did not want to give up power. Nobody ever wants to give up power. And so the national unions, as, as the story tells you, is Miguel Contreras comes in. I think at that time he was actually in Toronto. And they sent him back to LA to take over this thing. And of course, he, he's the one that's telling her, no, we're not going to let you have power, but we'll figure something out. And then they end up getting married. It's kind of like a... Well, it took a yeah, few years. But yeah, still, yeah, but it's still, it's still, it's still nice like, story. it's only in the movies. Well, it, it's a real LA story. Yeah. yeah. So let me tell you about one thing that's kind of uh, uh, alluded to, especially in the janitor's issue, and then also the fact that you see a, a great civil rights leader, um, the, the, the reverend there, a part of this, but that we try to uh, kind of avoid sometimes, and the unions have had some difficulty with it, but I think of all the institutions in Los Angeles, they've handled it better. And this is sometimes racial tension, especially the tension between African Americans and Latinos. Um, and you clearly see it, I think, in the janitors, um, uh, uh, when major most janitors were African American and unionized. And there was a deliberate policy to hire Latinos to undermine uh, that, that union. I also remember when I was growing up, my father was a, um, a security guard, and almost all security guards at that time were African American. And, but still, are, still are. And but you see a little bit of that transition happening in, in that area as well. Um, and then also, you know, you, we had this article today, or not today. I think it was published in Monday's newspaper about African Americans in construction and the fact that 
undocumented immigrants, day laborers, which, by the way, is what we'll talk about next next week. We have one of your colleagues, Abel Valenzuela, okay. coming, uh -huh. uh, along with um, uh, Bernard Parks and uh, Pablo Alvarado, who heads up the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Um, but it, that they're, they're saying that um, in, in this article, there's a group of African-American construction workers and contractors who say undocumented immigrants undermine the, the uh, attempt to, to try to get uh, African-Americans hired. How, do you deal with that at all in your book? or how do, um, how do you Not really in the book, but I can tell you mm -hmm. what I know about it. Um, you know, I think in some ways the real tragedy of the Martin Ludlow saga is that there was a real attempt there to build that bridge between the African-American community, community and the Latino community. And, you know, Martin, of course, came out of the <laughs> African-American community. Um, there have been a number of attempts to try to deal with that whole issue, which is an issue, obviously, in this city. Um, one is actually the organizing campaign that's underway right now um, by the Justice for Janitors Union, the Service Employees Union, to organize security guards. And they have not um, made that transition that you were describing right. toward Latino um, uh, employment, mostly because to become a security guard in, well, I think it's not just in LA, but in general, but in this city in particular, you need to get what's called a guard card, which is um, given out by the state of California. It only costs like $20 or something, but um, many immigrants are hesitant to apply to the state for anything of that kind. And so for that reason and some others, um, this remains a uh, African-American employment niche. Um, it's kind of a, a interesting story because the, um, the security guards work in the same buildings as the janitors. The janitors, as you saw in the film, did unionize some years ago now. It's in 1990, it was the big breakthrough, and they've been, and, and so now the same union that represents them is trying to organize the security guards, and I believe they will succeed. Um, and so you have the prospect of being in the same organization, these two groups of workers, one of them primarily African American, the other one um, primarily Latino. Right now, the security guards are basically paid the minimum wage, have almost no training. I mean, it's really a scandal when you think about like the post 9 11 atmosphere that this is possible. But typical training for a security guard in this city is two hours long. It consists of watching a video for an hour, having a tour of the building that you work in, and believe it or not, learning how to call 911. They're paid minimum wage, no benefits. It's a job often done by students who are, you know, working at night as security guards to make ends meet, that kind of thing. Um, they have, every day they see the janitors who are unionized, earn more money. Um, have health care benefits, et cetera. So this is a great prospect, and you know that the same union that represents the, gar the janitors is doing this is one thing. Um, and there have been a number of other examples of this kind of thing in Some recent years. Some people think so. that there may be a conflict with the same union representing security guards, sometimes supposed to, you know. That's how the building owners feel. That's exactly, yeah. that, that's exactly <laughs> what they're saying. Well, that's right. They're not happy about it because they know how strong the janitors union is, and they don't really want to have to contend with them for yet another occupational group. But I have a feeling they're going to cave in. I mean, so, we'll see. Well, what but about that's this underway right now? What about this charge about un undocumented immigrants undermining unions and the ability to unionize? Um, see, I don't see it that way, and this I do deal with in the book, though not in the case of the guards. Um, I looked at this for four occupations in my own research. One was actually janitors, another was construction, mm -hmm. um, another was uh, garment workers, and the fourth was um, truckers who serve the port of LA and Long Beach, as you probably know, living here. Um, and what I found out in, in looking back historically at how this all changed is that it seemed like what happened was in the 1970s and 1980s, as employers went after unions in general, all these occupations were highly unionized prior to, say, 1975. The timing is a little different for each one. Um, janitors were highly unionized at one time in LA when they were African American right. primarily. Um, truckers were 100% unionized. Construction was 100% unionized. Um, and even garments was about 50% unionized, believe it or not. Now it's less than 1% unionized. Mm. So employers in the whole country, and including in LA, went after um, unions very strongly in the 70s and 80s and succeeded in destroying a lot of union strength in all those industries and many others. And what happened was when that occurred is that the jobs became highly um, undesirable, right? So once, if you were, say, in construction is one of the better examples, you know, you're earning good money, excellent benefits, et cetera. In construction, actually commercial construction is still highly unionized even today, but residential has gone com almost Windows. completely non-union, and that's where this issue that you'll hear about next right. week comes up. Um, well, in that case, which was, by the way, there were very few African Americans employed there. It was basically white men. Um, there's also a construction boom occurring in the city, which is growing like crazy during this pe the same exact period, right? So anybody who could leaves the industry 
often for commercial construction or something else, because these jobs are no good anymore. That's when immigrants start getting hired. In other words, it's the employers basically who need to be focused on if you want to understand so who, this process. Who started the process first? They, they attack the unions. They succeed in doing that. Then the people who were working in those jobs before basically exit, often voluntarily, and employers turn to often undocumented, sometimes documented immigrants who they can hire for much less money, et cetera, and, you know, who they're actually actively recruiting in some industries, you know, south of the border and whatnot. So that's kind of the story. But to everyone's surprise, in the 1990s, and you see this example of the janitors right here, those workers are organized. No one thought they would do it. Everyone was, I mean, when I first started doing this research, people would say to me, but, but you can't organize those people. That's the kind of language that would be used. What well, turns out, the opposite is true. Immigrants turn out to be more, quote, organizable than almost anybody else these and days. And why is that? Well, I have a theory about it. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom was, and this has changed, but, you know, when I was first starting the research, and you still hear these arguments, well, undocumented people are scared of the government. They're not going to take the risks involved in organizing, right? That's one argument you would always hear. You would hear um, immigrants are comparing their, you know, what we consider crummy jobs, minimum wage, et cetera, to what they earned in Me Mexico or El Salvador or whatever, right? So they're not going to care about, you know, raising. that's another standard argument. Um, and besides, many of them are going to go back home, so they don't, you know, they're not interested in the long term. Why should they take the, you know, that's the kind of standard stuff you would hear. Well, it turns out that some of that may be true, but counterbalancing it are a number of things that are also different about immigrants that, um, you know, that people didn't understand, I think, at first. I think now, what I'm about to say is pretty well accepted now, at least inside the labor movement. Um, one thing is, um, many immigrants rely on, very strongly, on um, social networks in their own communities for daily survival. You come here from another country, right? You, I don't know, maybe some of you have had this experience or your families have, I don't know, but you, you, you need basic necessities are not easily accessible to you. You might not speak the language. You might not have any place to live. You might not have a job. You need housing. You need childcare. You need all those things. Who do you turn to? You turn to your, your community, people from the same place you're from. Maybe they're your relatives. Maybe they're just from the same hometown. Well, those, so those social networks that immigrants rely on so heavily which, at least in L.A., relatively, are relatively weak among the native-born population. It's not like they're completely absent, but they're much less important. And, you know, L.A. is famous for transiency and people moving around all the time, not knowing their neighbors, all those things. That's not true of immigrants. It's true of people who are born here often. Mm -hmm. um, so those networks can be really powerful tools when it comes to organizing a union. So that, if the union is able to tap in, as people like Maria Elena de Rosso are talented at doing, into those kind of networks, you can organize really quickly. So that's one advantage. That but the practical aspect of that is that um, person X comes into this country, and to get a job, they link to somebody who then gets them a job where they're working. That's right. So they're so all working at the same they're place. They're all working at the same place. And when we did the interviewing about the janitor's campaign, which was one of the cases in, in this book that's going to come out someday, um, we saw that people would talk about that. We, they live in the same apartment buildings. They take the same buses. They know all. The, so, so once you begin, so that's a, an advantage you don't have organizing native born workers. That's one thing. Another thing that many people told us, and I became convinced is true, though it's very hard to sort of prove this in any systematic way, is that many immigrants bring with them a, um, a different consciousness that's much more um, collectively oriented than the kind of American individualism that we, this country, is so famous for. Um, many were involved in their home countries in, you know, various kinds of social justice struggles. So they come here with a kind of, um, you know, experience of that maybe, and anyway, a different consciousness, a more collective orientation. That's another big plus when it comes to union mm -hmm. organizing. And then the third thing, which I think in some ways is maybe the most important of all, though they're all important, is um, being an immigrant in the United States, in L.A. in particular, but really everywhere these days, and this is even more true today than it was in the 90s, is still very highly stigmatized. You, you saw the film about Prop 187, right? This incredible hostility on the part of the native-born population to immigrants, which is very much alive, I think, even more so since 9-11 in many ways. Well, so if you're a person who's faced with that stigma and someone offers a helping hand, Maria Elena de Rosa, Local 11, the SEIU, whoever it is, it's all the more welcome, right? And you have that stigmatization in common with your co-workers often. Plus, here's an organization that's saying, we want to help you. We want to make your life better. We want to help you earn a living wage. This is, you're maybe more receptive to that than the average, you know, American-born worker who's just trying to figure out how to get ahead in the world kind of thing. So I think for all those reasons, and probably many more, um, it turned out that, again, to everyone's surprise, 
the, the immigrants who moved into these jobs that had once been unionized before were very interested indeed once the opportunity arose to reorganize. And so that's what we saw in the 1990s and you see bits and pieces of it in the film. And actually, you know, LA is kind of the shining star of immigrant organizing. Maria Elena DeRosso also led the Immigrant Worker Freedom Ride. I don't know if you've talked about yeah, that right. in the No, class. I haven't. Um, so which I think two it's years shown ago? for a second here. I, oh, something like that. It was about, I think it was not, um, 2003 around. Okay. I'm not sure exactly. Something like that, not, a couple years ago. And that's another interesting effort to build the, the bridge between the black and the brown community in that um, it deliberately embraced the language of the civil rights movement, right? The freedom rides of the 1960s, which tried to desegregate the South. I'm sure you know that history. Um, the immigrant worker freedom ride was using the exact same imagery and language. And, and it was a bus ride through the South and many other places visiting some of the sites of the civil rights struggles. So it was an attempt to bring those two streams of social movements together of the, you know, the civil rights movement of the past and the immigrant rights movement of today. And the labor movement was who led it. You know, it, Maria Elena DeRosso was her brainchild. And, um, you know, it was a coalition. There were many organizations involved, but labor really put the, the main energy into getting it off the ground. So that was another example. And, you know, I, I think that was quite deliberate. It was a real recognition of the need to build, to bring those communities together as Antonio Villaraigosa says at the end of the film. So, you know, labor, the, the, what's changed, and, you know, labor does not have a great track record on immigrant issues historically. Um, in 2000, the AFL-CIO reversed its historical opposition to immigrant rights, essentially. Well, they didn't call it immigrant rights, but, you know, they used to be in favor of employer sanctions and things like that, and embraced the immigrant rights cause, and still has, you know, is still attempting to do that. And that's a real sea change, and it really came out of the city. It was all the initiative politically to make that reversal came from LA. Um, and then came 9-11, which of course put immigrant rights into the deep freeze for a while, but I think it's beginning to come back and the Freedom Ride was an attempt to get that momentum going again. So I'm just going to ask you one more question before I let the students start asking questions. The future of unions, uh, I mean, we, we know that <laughs> big question. I know. <laughs> union membership has declined everywhere, including in L.A., but then Actually, in L.A., it's done much better than nationally, which right, is but, interesting. But yeah. then it stopped declining in L.A. and actually began increasing That's again, right. mm -hmm. okay? And so <laughs> what, what do you see? Uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you think we're going to continue to maintain that and maybe increase it a little bit, or do you think there'll be a point where it, it begins to decline? And I mean, certainly most commentators believe it's going to continue to decline nationally. Yeah, most people do. I mean, it's really hard to answer yeah. that. There is a lot going on. It's a very fluid situation. You may know that last summer the, um, there was a big split in the labor movement where um, several major unions, including the Service Employees Union and Unite Here, which we, you just saw, I'm pointing to the blank screen here, but what you just saw depicted here, which are very important unions in this city, left the AFL-CIO and formed a, a rival federation called the Change to Win. Federation. Um, well, explain the nature of the split, though. It's really about strategy, or is it about personalities, oh, or is it about... Oh, it's a complicated story. We could spend the whole evening talking about that, but um, in my view, it is about strategy, that these unions had a different notion and a different set of, um, a different sort of strategic repertoire involved, and, and a different kind of level of commitment to organizing than the, the I mean, I get, I, yeah, I get the sense that one union wanted to do, just continue doing what we've been doing conventionally, and that is getting involved in conventional politics, et cetera. Another one saying, hey, you know, the Democrats really aren't helping us. They're out of power, et cetera. Mm -hmm. let's, let's really organize workers and work at it from that perspective. Well, I, th I agree with you. Yeah. And the thing to note, though, since you're studying L.A. in this class, is that the, in Los Angeles, the change to win unions are the unions that are the dominant ones. That's not true nationally. And I actually think that that is what explains what you just said, that the, that the fact that the LA story is one of not dramatic growth, but some, it's very different from the national picture where union density, is, which just means the percentage of all workers who are unionized, has been declining, declining, declining. In LA, it's declined some over the long term, but it, there have been years where it's actually gone up in right. recent times, and it's sort of flat, basically. Right. So that's completely different from the national picture, and it's largely because those are the unions that are the growth engine of mm -hmm. American labor, insofar as there is one. Um, and they happen to be centered here. So this is, you know, that's one piece of the answer anyway. There, there's one other, I think, looming danger for unions that we're actually going to discuss in class in about two or three weeks, and that's the role of pensions, and especially for public yes, uh, employees, issue. is that uh, there's an incredible amount of unfunded liability. That, that means for, you know, everybody's promised a pension, and to be, make sure that we can pay them pensions for a long term, 
the cities have to put in a lot more money for city employees or for DWP or for the state or for teachers. And it's a lot, a lot, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars. This is a huge issue. You may have noticed in the newspapers that, or TV or wherever you get your news, that um, in or the your, private sector uh, pension uh, MySpace, that's where they get their news. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, General Motors and these other companies are reneging on their old pension obligations, but the public sector can't do that so easily. Right. But it is a huge issue. And, um, you know, I'm actually friendly with the, one of the deputy mayors who, under Villaraigosa who used to work for us at the Labor Center. Is that Larry Center. Frank? Larry Frank, yeah, who was telling me that he's now, I mean, he's a labor guy, right, but he's now um, <laughs> been charged with doing, representing the city on the management side in these negotiations, and he is not looking forward to it. It's going to be very difficult, even with a basically pro-labor mayor. This is just, you know, they can't print money. It's not like the federal government, so this is a huge issue that I'm glad you're going to be wrestling with it because yeah. there aren't I mean, any actually, uh, Villa Ragosa, probably the most labor-friendly mayor ever, is, is, is given all indications that he's not going to be friendly about giving raises to the unions. Well, that's right. And, you know, it's partly because of the pension problem that, you know, the city has so much money, they don't, you know, they could raise taxes, I suppose, but short of that, they have no way of generating additional revenue. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I hope that's not me. It is. I'm not going to answer it. I'm sorry. It's your editor about the title of your book. <laughs> So, Welcome to Los Angeles, right? I'm going to turn it off. Questions? Students? Dr. Blakesley. He's our oldest student. <laughs> By far. Actually, actually he's, our, he's our second. I don't think we can. Bill Fitzgerald left. Oh, Bill Fitzgerald. I was going to say Dr. Fitzgerald's the oldest student. but I wondered, back in the, uh, the 1980s, what tactics did the employers use to bust the unions so that um, unionized African-American janitors were replaced with non-unionized Latinos and white unionized um, building trades mm -hmm. workers were replaced with immigrants. How did, how, did the, how did they do it? How did the employers do it? Because couldn't they do it again? Well, they're trying to do it all the time. Yeah, I've That's never understood exactly yeah. what tactics they employed. Um, well, there are a lot of different tactics. One so, of the most- So the question, yeah. the question is, just in case some of the students didn't hear, is how did the employers or uh, be, how were they able to destroy or undermine the um, security, not security guards, excuse me, the, the janitors, who, which were mostly African American? And also the. Uh, and also construction. And the construction. Yeah. Well, it varies a little bit from industry to industry, but in those two industries, they used a lot of the same tactics. Um, one of the things they started to do was to, well, both those industries involve a lot of subcontracting anyway, right? If, you, if you're a, a builder, you don't, you, know, you don't do all the work yourself. You hire subcontractors in various. Um, ways that you hire, you know, drywallers and you hire painters and you hire carpenters and so on, right? So one of the things that happened in construction, and I'll get to the janitorial in a minute, which in some ways has a very parallel structure, is many of the companies started doing what they call double-breasting, like a double-breasted jacket, right, that has two, two pockets. So one, the same firm would have a union side and a non-union side, and the, and the non-union side would start making low bids on work to the, you know, to the builders and hiring, you know, lower wage workers. That's one technique that was used. In, in janitorial as well, um, there was a, a kind of restructuring in the industry where um, there was a time long ago when um, building owners would, you know, clean the buildings themselves. They would just hire janitors. Increasingly, they started subcontracting the work to other companies. And so um, in order to keep the industry union, you would have to basically be actively organizing all the new contractors, right? Are you following me? Yeah. So a typical janitorial contract even today has a 30-day cancellation clause, okay? So if you try to organize, well, so um, the companies began to, again, to do this double-breasting thing where they would open up a non-union subsidiary and try to get work by underbidding the, you know, the union competition. That's one technique. Um, enough, in order to combat that, of course, the union has to organize the whole industry or else they're ineffective, which they eventually did do with, with the new immigrant workforce in the 90s. But quite honestly, in my view, the unions weren't really minding the store, and so they began to let this slip away from them little by little, and pretty soon you had a sort of tipping point where the industry became more and more non-union. It's different in different industries, though. So like, for example, in trucking, which is one of the other ones that this happened in, um, deregulation was a big part of the story. Um, in 1980, there was a new legislation passed that completely deregulated the trucking industry, and almost overnight, um, it became non-union in the port area. It's still, the long-haul trucking remained unionized longer. But, so there are different mechanisms, but this is not an L.A. story. This is a national story that in the 70s and 80s, 
you know, employers kind of went on the warpath against organized labor, and they were pretty successful at it. That's what's led to that sharp decline in union density that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. So, you know, and LA had its particular version of that. Um, the difference here was partly that the city was growing very rapidly in population and economically too. So there was in some ways less resistance than in some other places on the part of organized labor because the members, the workers often could move laterally into, you know, either other union jobs or equally desirable jobs, but still as a percentage of this growing workforce, unions went down, down, down in that period. Dr. Marks? You were a student attending a um, university charged with promoting social justice. And you looked around and you noticed that... Are we talking about UCLA? <laughs> 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 just a hypothetical. Just a hypothetical. Let's just say you were at one of these kind of social justice oriented universities and you looked around and you noticed that the custodians cleaning the bathrooms um, in a particular building on campus um, were not unionized and were not getting benefits and were not being paid a living wage. And you cared about that issue. What would you recommend? What kind of steps would you recommend? Well, a good question because this has happened at a number of universities. Whether the universities are committed to social justice or not, students often are. And there have been a number of cases of living wage campaigns of the kind that was described for the city of LA on college campuses around the country. There was one at Harvard. Right. Um, I remember having a conversation with our dean at UCLA, and I said, you know, you could have this happen here. <laughs> but you know, I was sort of half joking. It hasn't happened at UCLA, but it, the union, they are unionized, actually, the janitors at, at our campus. But um, it's an issue. Many students have gotten involved in that all over the country, and you know, sometimes they succeed. Um, you know, universities pride themselves not necessarily on being vehicles of social justice, but at least on being good employers and being, you know, creating a kind of sense of community. And so they are very vulnerable. Um, it's actually much easier to organize universities than, um, you know, private sector employers generally. So there's been some success there. Yale is another place where there have been big struggles of this kind. So um, what are the elements of, of success? are, I would imagine, in a, in a sense, publicity and shaming the mm -hmm. administration into what, what they're doing. Um, but how do you, I mean, sometimes... How do you organize against yeah. these hostile employers? Is that... Well, I don't know that they're hostile employers, per se. I mean, the easiest... They often are. At UCLA, it took ten, 10 years to organize the teaching assistants. Yeah, but it usually takes, it usually takes students 10 years to get through UCLA anyway. So it's like... <laughs> So that's not unusual. No, I'm kidding. Most employers do not welcome the idea of unionization. So if you're going to succeed in getting unionization, they're not going to just say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. That doesn't yeah, happen, no, doesn't even happen. in universities. So it does require some imagination and some struggle. And the successful campaigns are the ones that really, in my view, try everything. That you need a, a, a comprehensive campaign where you do everything you can think of, the no stone unturned approach, essentially. And that's, by the way, the, what led to success for both the hotel workers, the um, that you know the stuff you saw in the film, the janitors and so on. That's what they did. They tried to build coalitions. Um, they tried publicity. They tried to embarrass the employers. The Justice for Janitors people would go to um, you know country club type places where the building owners who were responsible for those contracts were having lunch, and they would get in their face and say, "How come you're only you know you're only paying these people seven dollars an hour or whatever it was at the time? You know that kind of thing." Yeah. So they were pretty you know in your face about it, and that's pretty effective. But they don't always win. It's hard. There's a lot of resistance to this stuff. And I mean, one of the things we always talk about is how uh, difficult it is to organize, but how difficult it is to sustain that. Now, if I was giving advice to an administrator at a university, the easiest way to defeat this is you just drag it on until May, and then all the problems go home. Well, sometimes. Depends <laughs> well, how, how savvy and smart the yeah. students involved are. Do you have something that's happening here? Well, I don't know. We can, why don't we ask a troublemaker? Uh, Alberto, why don't you say something? <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, going off on your comment, it's uh, it's a tough deal because recently, in a nutshell, LMU's in that situation in this building. Um, we have a night shift, and they come in, they do their job, but there's a lot of problems, mm -hmm. and I could, we can go on and on. You know what they are. Students know they read the Loyola, um, but behind that, um, I discovered that SEIU did a side deal with LMU. What kind of side deal? Side deal uh, that the school uh, would pay the workers a living wage and there would be no union. And this institution isn't so favorable. That sounds very unusual for a CIU to that do that. That doesn't sound, I mean, no, but, I have but, no idea if you're no, right. I, I have I, not heard about Yeah, I, I talk to these people on a, on a, on a daily basis. Uh -huh. And, you know, their, their argument was, well, if we let this one school be non-union, 
then we can gain other contracts and other victories mm -hmm. and other locations. They told you this themselves. Yes, and if we let this one go, you know, it's like we'll sacrifice something for the better of everything else. That, How would that, that help everything else? Well, I, I, exactly, and that's where I'm just like, that's a, just the, 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 the logic behind it. And, and since the promise was made from LMU's perspective to give the living wage. Did then, they do that? Yes, they have. Then everything's going to be fine. But, I mean, with dealing with uh, the workers and hearing their comments and their situation, I mean, it would be nice to have a shop steward. But, I mean, that's not going to happen. Um, but they could unionize with somebody else, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And, and I guess, unfortunately, hearing that from the SEIU's pers you know, side of it, that they had to do something to get something, it's just like, wow, that's really undermining. And it sounds like that double-breasted type of situation where... Yeah, I'm very surprised to hear that, but I, I really, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It. But yeah, it doesn't sound like them. I agree. So well, what, is the, yeah. Yeah, what is the current status of organizing here? Um, for University Hall, it's outsourced for the workers, for the cleaners, for janitors, mm -hmm. from United Building Services. On the main campus, they they work for LMU. They are they get their bread and butter. You know, they have their tuition admission, their their benefits. Their but non-union. But they're not union But the outside contractor could be organized, of course, independent of whatever. Well, United Building there Services is. is a union uh, honoring uh, oh, company. It is? Uh -huh. Yes, they honor the SIU master contract. However, LMU, once again, it's like, well, we, we pay these people living wages. You know, let us, we know what to do. You know, we'll give them benefits and we'll, we'll do this. So the issue that. is the people not in this building but elsewhere? Is that? No, no, no. They already have their bread and butter. They're okay. They're well taken care of. I, I, I talk to these uh, people who clean on the main campus, who do the gardening. They're like, we don't want union. We already, get, we already have our, uh -huh. our own. But the people in this building are like, you know, we want... The, uh, the a higher wage, we want these eight hours, we want to qualify for benefits, you know, we're being paid, worked over time without pay. <laughs> so, so, and, and it doesn't sound, if they're a contractor, I don't see why they'd be covered by this agreement you mentioned, if that exists, because they're working for somebody else, they're not really employees of them. And, and, and that's so. where I'm, I'm in a loss, because I, I, I talked to SEIU, and SEIU is like, oh, you know, Alberto, great job, you know, but... Uh, they, United Building Services fall under the, the master contract. They are unionized then. They're but, just not paid properly, it how, like. But the thing is, they go, well, with the Loyola's case, we did a side, a side agreement, you know, and <laughs> that institution is going to pay those workers a living wage. And, and that's where I'm just like, wow. I'm so, sorry that uh, I don't know anything that's, about this. Yeah, exactly. It like, so, you know, it's something worth That needs to be investigated, more, but... How many of you students have heard about this situation going on? Really? Oh my. Oh. Well, students can make a difference here if there's if you all are concerned. I mean, we've seen that elsewhere in the country, so it's an opportunity of sorts. So you would it would be much better if you had the union's cooperation, obviously. Uh, any other yeah. questions, students, comments? Oh, we here. Uh, that Cornelius, I can't. Uh, by the way, Martin Ludlow was in the film several times. We just never directly not talked really about him. Right? He's not yeah. introduced, but you see him many, many times. Sort of a short guy, yeah. skinny guy. Yeah. With Martin Lolo resigning and uh, Antonio fighting LAUSD and the UTLA and the workers at the airport, is it harder for him to fight against the unions? Is there political fallout for the unions equals LA politics now? Is there, what's the fallout? Is it harder for, for who? For Antonio? For Antonio and the unions just get involved in politics. You know, in some ways, Antonio was elected. Well, it's a complicated story, right? The first time he ran, the unions were his main supporters. The second time, it was a little bit more divided. But right. um, so he's a, definitely a friend of labor, but now he's, you know, he's management, right? He's representing the city, so that complicates things a lot. I actually think the LA County Fed story will have a happy ending. You know, when Miguel Contreras died, we were all very freaked out. And I mean, by we all, I mean people who care about the labor movement in the city. and. You know, Martin Ludlow, I mean, I know there's been a sequel to this story, but he managed to pull it together. You know, he came into that vacuum. He led the LA County Fed through the split in the summer that we discussed earlier, which is a, not an easy thing to do. That you know, it was very difficult to figure out how to deal with that on the local level. He led them through the November elections when, as you know, the anti-union propositions that were on the ballot were all defeated, and LA was very important in that process, as was, you know, Martin's leadership. Well, now we're faced with this 
very awful situation, which I feel like we haven't heard the whole story yet, but we'll see. I don't, you know, I don't know enough yeah. about it to say much about that. I, and maybe it won't be Maria Elena, but whoever takes over will be able to, the, the institutional structure is there. The LA County Fed is not going away. It's gonna continue to be effective. And I, you know, it will overcome this crisis too, I think. What, so. What's sad, I mean, it's not only a personal strat, uh, tragedy for Martin Ludlow, but in the film you see that what really prompts Maria Elena to organize Local 11 is that the leadership, I mean, almost all the membership is almost all Latinas. And the leadership was mostly white males. This is in 1989 89. when she took over. And right. they had the meetings in English with a 95% Spanish-speaking membership. It was ridiculous. I mean, that's why she did right, it. Right. Yeah. And, and so there was, uh, unions are no different than many other organizations and institutions when leadership gets detached and, and they're no longer connected to the community, to the who they're supposed to serve. Maria Elena came in there and was able to really make that case. Uh, and, and the whole discussion was not only about this new leadership that has a new vision, but also in a sense had a new ethic. You know, The, the tragedy with, with uh, Martin Ludlow is it begins to question that assumption because if the accusations are correct, in a sense, quote unquote, there was some corruption going on, with this new leadership that was progressive, that was multicultural, et cetera. And that, that's a real... Well, it's a very sad story. You know, and I, again, I, I will, we'll see what comes of it. I mean, I don't think we've heard the whole saga yet. But um, no, I agree with you. I do think, though, that um, you know, there is a big progressive community, as you saw in the film, right? Yeah. That that momentum is not going to go away because of one right. crisis of this kind. And you know, it is, well, I think it's very sad. But The movement is greater but, than any one yeah, individual. And, and there's a lot of other people in it. You right. saw many of them tonight on the screen. Right, so. right. Uh, Dr. Singleton, yeah, the there's Institute, a mic right there. Thank you. Uh, the in Institute of Industrial Relations, uh, both in LA and in Berkeley, used to be sort of a think tank for the unions. Do they still serve that purpose? They used to, in fact, provide a great deal of the leadership themselves and, and used, often went out and fought with the unions against the, the kind of uh, stuff that you were just talking about. In fact, uh, they, were, they were very, m many of their publications uh -huh. uh, were, were, uh, were very important in, in the union movement. Well, I don't like you using the past tense because we still would like to play that role. Um, I, this is a whole saga in itself, and I've been very involved in it since the year 2000 when the state legislature funded a new statewide labor institute, which I was the director of, called the Institute for Labor and Employment, based at UCLA and at Berkeley, as you said. And we did a lot of work along the lines you just described. Um, when Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor, the first budget that he produced included major cuts to our funding. Um, actually, it was on my birthday. It just so happened that the press conference was held so I can remember the date it was. Anyway, um, but... Um, he didn't send you a birthday it, card it, with no, that. He no, didn't, he didn't know about my birthday, I guess, but this was a different kind of present than you usually get on your birthday. Anyway, um, that year he succeeded in taking away half of our money. We successfully fought to get it back the year after that, but the following year, um, the money was cut completely from the budget, and just yesterday we were in Sacramento beginning the process of trying to get the funding restored this year. And I actually am pretty optimistic about that. I mean, we won't really know until the summer. But um, the political landscape has changed in some ways that I think will help us. The, the November election results are one factor. The fact that the University of California itself um, needs democratic support in, the, in Sacramento at the moment because of this compensation scandal that maybe you've heard about, yeah. um, you know helps us as well. And also there's just more money around and meanwhile Schwarzenegger is sort of moving to the center. So who knows what will happen, but we're, we're not gone yet. <laughs> so, but we have had to spend a lot of our time that used to go into the work you described fighting these budget battles, which is, you know, unfortunate. But it's a very unique type of organization that you typically don't see at universities. I mean, some Catholic universities, you see it in terms of theological studies or pastoral studies where they're really active in terms of uh, the Catholic Church, but you don't see these type of units in most universities. Well, I, you know, that's less true than you might think. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes Well, that's no. the conventional um, perspective. That's, yeah. Well, that's the line that our um, opponents sometimes argue. I don't think it's really true. First of all, the Institute of Industrial Relations has been around since 1946 at both UCLA and Berkeley. Um, the idea of this 2000 initiative was to turn it into a statewide unit, because since 1946, there's a few more campuses in the UC right. system, right? And so that was really the goal of that. And so, but the concept is not new. And the labor centers have been around since, which is a component of, um, the, of both of the institutes, <coughs> since 1964. So this is, these are venerable institutions, and such institutions do exist at many other universities. The most famous <coughs> in the United States is at Cornell, which is, they all come about right after World War II. 
Um, Rutgers has one. There, there are quite a few. There's a whole professional um, organization in this field of industrial relations. It's kind of an old-fashioned name. That's why we tried to change the name at one point, which we're now stuck with the old one for various reasons. But anyway, so it's not quite true. I mean, I think... Um, well, and I, didn't, if you think I, I didn't mean just UCLA and Berkeley. I meant just this area. Mm -hmm. are, are there in other areas other than industrial relations? Well, is think it, about agricultural extension, well, true, right? True. You know, Almost as an example, that's all an the analogy Midwestern we universities, point to. Yeah. Or business schools, for that matter, which train future business leaders. Why shouldn't the university also train future labor leaders? You know, this is how we look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and if you look at the resources in California that go into the, the UC business schools, and for that matter, agricultural <coughs> programs at UC Davis and whatnot, we're tiny compared to all that. So, um, you know, I don't yeah. completely buy that. I think that the university is a public university. It should have links to the yeah. wider community, and labor is one important piece of that. So that's how we look at it anyway. One last time for one last question. Well, I'll ask it. Um, <laughs> uh, studying you, okay, it seems to me that there are very few people studying unions, given how important it I is. I know them all myself. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. But is it's it true? a small field. Well, yeah, because, um, well, they're, they're more than you might think, but it's, it has shrunk over the years. You know, I, I, um, because of being in, in uh, the driver's seat in this institute for a while, I have read all the old annual reports from the Institute of Industrial Relations at UCLA going back to the 1940s. And I remember reading the very first one where um, the, the head of the, um, of the UC Berkeley Institute, by the way, in those days, the first one was Clark Kerr himself, who later, of course, went on to be the chancellor, and he's now dead. But, but um, they had a conference back in 1947, and they had 10,000 people attend it at UCLA on, wow. you know, problems of labor or something like this. And, you know, we're happy when we get 1,000 at an event. So, you know, that gave me pause. So it's true that, you know, as union density has declined in the United States over time, you know, so has interest in this area. But, again, it's not dead yet. There's a professional association, the Labor and Employment Research Association, that meets annually. There's the... Um, University and um, Association for Labor Education, which is another big or these all have thousands mm -hmm. of people in them. So it's true that they have a history that I just is get the sense. I mean, okay, I, I'm I'm very narrow minded. I'm just talking about like I'm a political scientist, mm -hmm. and I I can barely think of about two or three people who study the role of po unions in politics and elections. It just and yet they are the most dominant force in electoral politics in California right now. Mm -hmm. Yet. There's really very few people There's relatively who little literature. It's true. It's just, I mean, it's maybe because amazing. people don't like to study decline, you know, yeah. that's part of it. Um, I actually have noticed that the, the disciplinary hung of this field has changed. So it used to be economics was the center of it back in Clark Kerr's day, right? Um, political science had a role. There were, you know, there are studies, of course, as you right. know, in the field, but they're relatively few. It was never that centered in political science. It's actually moved more and more towards sociology, which is great for me since that's what I happen to be in. But um, that's really been a shift. So there is actually, there's a new labor and labor movement section in, that has several hundred people in it, in the American Sociological Association, for example. And I think you're going to, it's become more of a study of social movements in some ways because right. of the character of the labor movement today. So, but I don't, just as I don't think the labor movement is going to die, even if it, you know, ebbs and flows over the decades, um, I don't think the study of it will either. I mean, I think this is something that. Well, I was just trying to make a point to the students. Here. Uh, yeah. Make a point to the students that there's a wide open field here. That if you're interested in writing papers or even pursuing graduate work, this is one area where there's uh, a lot of um, po possibilities. Hey, I want to thank uh, Professor Ruth Milkman from UCLA. Thank you, Jane Goldfarb. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's my pleasure. All I right. wish I could see you all better, but yeah. thanks and for coming. And we'll see you guys next week.